Johnson were treated like movie stars. The two snappily dressed bachelors were often seen in New York's most fashionable night spots. One of their favorite hangouts was the Stork Club, managed by Sherman Billingsley, who used to place illegal bets for them. It was here, one New Year's Eve, that Hoover and Tolson betrayed the secret they shared, a secret that could have destroyed Hoover's reputation and his career. Well, it was a wonderful night at the Stork Club. It was New Year's Eve, 1936. And I was the only woman at the table. Louisa Stewart, a famous model, and her boyfriend, Art Arthur, had been invited to join Hoover and Tolson at Walter Winchell's table. We all had on those crazy hats and the, the things you, you blew. And, and uh, at one point, I'm pointing a, a, a toy gun at Hoover, who has his hands up. And uh, it was just a, a, a great night. It was getting really late, and Hoover was rather annoyed with, with Clyde. He thought Clyde had had too much to drink. And finally, the decision was to go to the, the Cotton Club up in Harlem. We went in, in the FBI limousine, and uh, Art and I sat in the back seat, and Clyde and, and, and Jedgar, as we called him, sat in the two jump seats. And then I saw that they were holding hands. And I guess he was forgiving him, but I thought it was sort of odd. Without a love of my own. <laughs> I remember the Cotton Club that night very well because there were a couple there who were black and white dancing together. And that made Hoover furious. And then Clyde, who was still pretty drunk, said, well, he'd like to dance with Hoover, which we all thought was very funny. Well, we left, finally. And in the taxi going home, then Art said to me, it's common knowledge that they're queer, that they're fairies. Those are the terms used in those days. But he said, we don't talk about it. Whether we like it or not, um, it's always been true that a public man's private sex life makes him vulnerable. Hoover knew this. Uh, he would eventually seek out uh, one of the most distinguished psychiatrists in Washington, um, to ask for advice and help because he was so terrorized by his own sexuality. What was he as direct director of the FBI to do about these urges that he had? In Washington, D.C., police detectives were picking up intelligence about Hoover's private life. Guy Hoddle was a retired or, or fired agent. He was an alcoholic. And Hoddle would, every time he had a few drinks, he would tell stories about parties that went on in J. Edgar Hoover's house when that there were sex parties there. No girls. So when you say sex parties, what does that mean if you have no girls? Joe Scheinman also heard that years earlier in New Orleans, Hoover had been picked up by the Vice Squad. See, New Orleans is a wide open town. There were prostitutes who worked there. And of course, well, you know and I know. But I mean, if you have a dozen prostitutes on this work on the streets, you'd at least have a half a dozen male prostitutes. You picked up one of the pretty boys, and Vice Squad apparently was watching him and arrested him. Now, I don't know the details of the arrest. I never got it, other than he was arrested and charged. He charged with a sex offense, and the arrest was wiped, washed out. In Las Vegas, 
Hoover's homosexuality was more than a matter of gossip. In the casinos, the wise guys talked about how it gave the mafia a hold over him. Irving Resnick, who was the Las Vegas representative of the big New England mob family, um, said in, in 1971 that Lansky was the one who had, quote, nailed J. Edgar Hoover. I remember Ash Resnick at the Caesars Palace. He used to be the manager of the nightclub there. He told me that uh, Maya Lansky had some pretty strong evidence that uh, Hoover and Tolson uh, were both homosexuals. When he was asked what that meant, he said that Lansky had obtained um, photographs of Hoover in a compromising situation with, with Clyde Tolson. One man who actually claims to have seen such photographs is Gordon Novell, a controversial figure with connections to the intelligence community. Novell, who had worked for the White House in the early 1960s, became involved in a complicated legal action which the White House wanted him to pursue, but which Hoover wanted dropped. So I went to the White House, and the White House sent me to Mr. Angleton, Director of Counterintelligence, CIA. We met in a restaurant. And I told him my problem, and he says, I know what your problem is. He said, you need to tell Mr. Hoover that you've met with me and uh, that you're not going to dismiss the lawsuit and that you've seen this. At which point he opened up his briefcase and pulled out a couple of photographs of, uh, of Mr. Hoover in flagrante delicto, I guess is one way to describe it. Having oral sex. This testimony does not stand alone. Uh, I talked to a former regular officer in the OSS, that's the predecessor of the CIA, um, who said that after the war, um, he went to dinner with other OSS American intelligence colleagues, and that after dinner, when over the brandy stage, when conversation turned to um, the private lives of, of public people, um, his host went out of the room and then came back with a photograph and this was passed around the table, and the photograph um, showed two men, Hoover and Tolson, um, engaged in homosexual activity. In New Orleans, where the CIA and the Mafia had sometimes collaborated, Mafia Don Carlos Marcello told Gordon Novell that he too had seen a photograph. I had volunteered the information that I had seen a picture of uh, uh, Mr. Hoover and performing oral sex, and he said that he had seen it too, and that it had been used to keep the uh, FBI, but not the Justice Department, off the back of the mob. There was another way in which the Mafia could have learned of Hoover's homosexuality. In the late 1950s, Hoover was a regular visitor at the home of Meyer Lansky's friend, the former bootlegger Louis Rosenstiel, and his wife Susan. I found out early in the marriage that my husband was bisexual. He was involved with Roy Cohn, the assistant counsel to Senator McCarthy. And he used to come with a little boyfriend, and they used to like, uh, you know, uh, squeeze each other, and uh, that I should really see that he was uh, a gay boy. So one day, Rowan Steele said, we're going to go this evening to the Plaza Hotel. And Roy Cohn was there. And he said, you'll be very much surprised at what you'll see. So I didn't have much to say. I said, all right, I'll go. When they arrived at the plaza, Rosenstiel insisted that they enter by a side door. We uh, went up into the uh, elevator. It was, we went to either the second or the third floor. There was a sign on the door where he led me to, not to disturb. And we knocked on the door, and Roy Cohn opened the door. And we went in, and there was, <laughs> there was uh, this gentleman. Uh, he was dressed as a woman. And uh, Roy introduced me. He said, I'd like you to meet Mary. Well, I, uh, I knew uh, the name wasn't Mary because uh, he looked just like J. Edgar Hoover. In fact, he was... Uh, very solid looking, and uh, he had like a little uh, growth, and he was dressed in a uh, black uh, shirt.